Hello everyone and welcome to the Director's Seminar. I'm Professor Henrietta Moore. I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Global Prosperity. And it's my great pleasure uh, today to be able to welcome Dr. Indrajit Roy from the University of York. Dr. Roy is Senior Lecturer in Global Development Politics at York. He's worked in the development sector for many years prior to undertaking his development uh, doctoral studies at the University of Oxford. He's a future ESRC Future Research Leader Fellowship at Oxford, and he's been at York since 2017. His research and teaching contribute to critical approaches to studying the politics of global development with a focus on new development futures. And he's trying in his work to reframe the discipline. Dr. Roy's work illustrates the important ways in which agents in the global south disrupt prevailing understandings of development. And by going beyond Eurocentric and elite centric narratives, his work opens up new debates for critical explorations of development. And this in turn shapes and intensifies efforts at diversifying and decolonizing the field of development and trying in new ways to make it uh, a reformed global discipline. So this evening, he's going to talk to us about inclusive development futures and global possibilities. And so Dr. Roy, the floor is yours. Can I welcome you to the IGP? Thank you so much, uh, Henrietta. Um, it's, it's amazing to be here. I've been following some of the very inspiring work that everyone in this institute has been undertaking. And I'm really pleased to be able to share my thoughts with everyone here today. Um, I want to assure everyone that this is very much a work in progress, so I will really look forward to hearing what you think. Um, let me begin by saying that my work focuses on exploring um, new development futures, um, and by development I mean the ensemble of practices, processes and possibilities that encompass economic change as well as social transformation. So here I'm standing on the shoulder of giants who have urged us to shift away from measures of income, wealth and GDP in thinking about development, to think about development not only in terms of economic growth, but one that enhances well-being, capabilities, dignity and humanity of people across the board, respects our embeddedness in the broader environment and relations of humans with non-humans. Now, of course, I'm not going to cover every single aspect of this in my lecture, uh, in my talk today, but that's the general ways in which I've, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with colleagues to think about development. And I suspect uh, colleagues here will have a similar understanding of prosperity as well. So it is in these emerging practices, processes and possibilities as they are innovated in the global south where the vast majority of the world's people, some 88%, if I'm not mistaken, live. And that's what I'm interested in. Now, a focus on the Global South is always interesting because of the way the importance of the Global South has tended to be dismissed in discussions on the global order, global governance, and global development. Um, and here I'm quoting uh, Henry Kissinger, um, you know, when he says, uh, nothing important can come from the South. Uh, he's supposed to have told the Chilean ambassador in 1969 when he was national security advisor. The axis of history, he emphasized, starts in Moscow, goes to Bonn, crosses over to Washington, and then to Tokyo. What happens in the South is of no importance. These are his words, not mine. Now, the Global South, is in some important aspects um, the inheritor of a vibrant tradition of mutual solidarity and anti-colonial struggle pioneered by what used to be called the third world, a category that appears rather quaint today. But it would be useful to remember the demand for status that lay at the heart of the foreign policy of the third world countries. As Alfred Sauvé, and I'm sure I've got the name wrong uh, because he's French, um, but as he coined, the, he coined the term third world and he said, and I quote, for in the end, this third world, little known, exploited, scorned like the third estate itself wants to be something. It appears today that the global south or third world uh, or whatever it is that we want to call it may finally be able to be something 
Many observers see hope in the emergence of the BRICS economies, the acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, as prominent actors on the global stage. Of course, you also have other countries that are celebrated as emerging market economies, but the BRICS appear to have had some staying power. The heads of government of the BRICS countries meet regularly in BRICS summits, which have gained significant international profile. Observers look out for BRICS summits because there are so many decisions taken that could impinge on the world order. A major initiative of the BRICS has been to establish the New Development Bank based in Shanghai as an alternative to existing multilateral financial institutions. Such sustained collective dynamics have also worried analysts that the BRICS pose more than just an economic challenge to conventional Western dominance because they might actually be pushing for a significant restructuring of the global order. Now, the rise of the BRICS probably does threaten to upend liberal internationalism, the institutional scaffolding for the prevailing global order which has arguably marginalized and subordinated the third world or the global south, if you will have it. And so many observers have pinned hopes on the state-led market economies of the BRICS as offering an alternative to neoliberal economic policies of the global south. Now, I must say that I'm not so sanguine about an exclusive focus on the BRICS states as a challenge to global capitalism. I don't think the BRICS are harbingers of socialism or statism or whatever it is that you know, the global left might uh, hope for. Although yes, their state permeated market economies may threaten many of the liberal elements of the global order. So in reflecting on the possibilities of inclusive development futures, it is towards relations between states and societies in the broader global South that I look to while thinking. Um, about inclusive development futures. Um, you could say that this is a global south from below approach, which does not ignore the role of the state, but reflects on relations between states and societies. So in terms of what to expect, I will use three empirical hooks for this talk. One, which refers to welfare transfers in the global south. The second, which refers to protective discriminations aimed at power sharing. And third, some reflections on the global order. You will see two conceptual threads that run across the three sections. One is the notion of the share, and the second is the politics of presence. And you know, I'm, I'll be really happy to hear what you think about these uh, ideas. Now, I want to start my talk by taking us to a village in Northern India's Bihar state. Bihar is by all accounts, one of the most impoverished parts of the world, over 90% rural, and much of the agriculture there is based on small and marginal holdings that are barely enough to sustain their owners. While many observers have blamed Bihar's notorious governance for its poverty, in fact, the roots of the state's impoverishment go back to the way in which it was colonized by Britain to serve as a rural hinterland for its prized possessions in its Indian empire a pattern, we must note, that was continued by post-colonial Indian governments. The Bihari elite, I might add, was more than complicit in this process of internal colonization. Now, back in 2010, while I was doing ethnographic fieldwork for my doctoral work, I was sitting in the office of a minor bureaucrat attached to the village council. Since I was viewed as a harmless academic with little relevance or influence from far away England, my presence was mostly ignored. While I was there, a group of about 20 people who worked on the Indian government's flagship National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, NREGA for short, sought an audience with the bureaucrat. They'd come to ask him to pay them, for, pay them the wages for work that they had done over a month ago. The bureaucrat remembered them, but then he asked, how can I pay you? Um, you, don't, you didn't do any work there, did you? You lazy people, he added for good measure. So he goes on to say, I hired a JCB machine, you know, one of those huge machines that sort of move earth to do the earth work. There's no way I can pay you for work you've not done, can I? At this, one of the women in the group challenged him. What do you mean? Did my father-in-law ask you to use the machine? 
That work is meant for people like us. You and your machines are stealing it. It is our share. There's nothing I can do, the bureaucrat shrugged his shoulder. The other women now took the lead. This is our share, they repeated, and they used the word hissa uh, in uh, rural Hindi. And you can't deny us that. The men followed the lead of the women and repeated the point about the monies being their share. The bureaucrat refused to budge. We'll take up the matter with the president of the village council. The women threatened as they started to leave after this brief encounter. Yes, yes, take it up with the president of the Indian Union for all I care, the bureaucrat taunted them. Just don't waste my time. Once they left, the bureaucrat laughed heartily at what he called the audacity of the women who, he informed me, were untouchable to refer to their social position at the base of the caste hierarchy that frames Indian society. Share indeed, he scoffed. He then proceeded to explain that although the program mandated using manual labor to undertake public works, that could be digging a pond, laying a road, doing some afforestation works, it was easier, cheaper, and more efficient to get the job done using JCB machines. Using machines instead of people also meant you didn't have to deal with what he called labor problems, or indeed any labor at all. Now, the argument between the workers and the bureaucrat is not unique to rural Bihar. This audience will be familiar with the rather fierce debates on the impact of automation on labor and the ways in which relations between workers and labor, sorry, workers and machines have shaped and reshaped relations between states and societies since at least the Industrial Revolution, if not prior. On the one side are those who worry quite legitimately that automation will lead to the loss of jobs and increase unemployment. The loss of jobs in turn has not only economic consequences, but also social and political ones. After all, work defines who we are. Others have argued that automation provides opportunities for reskilling. There is no value in people doing something that can be done better by machines. So if automation does result in the loss of some kinds of jobs, especially one considered by workers themselves to be degrading, such as cleaning sewage of human excreta, for instance, or pulling rickshaws with your own hands uh, with, to, to, to transport people, so be it. Now, within half an hour of this exchange, the bureaucrat received a visitor, the president himself um, of the village council, I should clarify. The, worker had complained, the workers had complained uh, about not being paid their share. Well, I should say the villagers, not strictly the workers, because they hadn't worked uh, on, on, the, on the work, uh, on the project. Um, they're asking for their share, the bureaucrat asked incredulously. He then went on to mumble something about machines. The president interrupted him. I don't care how efficient the machines were. I don't care whether these people worked on the project or not. All I care is that you must give them their share. These people are poor and we can't deny them their share. The bureaucrat now switched tack and assumed an air of humility. But sir, he said, most of them don't even belong, and he used that word in English, to your village alluding to the fact that the workers were from a neighboring district. Why are you worrying so much? I'm not worrying about anyone, the bureaucrat retorted. It's just that they are here in the village now, aren't they? They live here, they work here. You want me to ask them to leave over a few rupees? But you know I can't pay them their full wages, the bureaucrat replied. I've already paid for the machine. The president frowned. Just pay them what you can. The president left. The bureaucrat, very flustered, grumbled about the additional work he would have to do. He's out to get his cut, he said, alluding to the possibility that the president would siphon a part of the monies that would be paid to the workers. The bureaucrat himself was Hindu and referred to himself as of the highest caste. By contrast, he informed me, the president was low caste, born to serve, not to rule. In the caste hierarchy, the low castes occupy a somewhat in-between position between the so-called untouchables and the self-styled high castes. So are, they are, in, in, in some sense, you could call them the in-betweeners. Of course, the bureaucrat continued, the president could not be expected to understand governance. And he added that word in English for good measure. Now, I found these exchanges illuminating to help me think about the ways in which the possibilities of inclusive development futures might be imagined in the global south. 
what might development look like in a world where we can no longer take for granted the certainties of work and welfare, government and governance, and order, assuming we ever could. As I reflected on these challenges, on these exchanges, I'm struck by the claims and counterclaims that were made that afternoon by the villagers, their president, and the bureaucrat. In referring time and again to their share, the workers or villagers steered clear of advancing the juridical language of rights. You might argue that they could have since the program under which they sought their wages was a constitutional right, but of course they couldn't because they hadn't after all labored on the project as the law mandated them. Given the obvious power asymmetries between the workers and the high caste bureaucrat, or as I should more accurately say between the untouchable villagers and the high caste bureaucrat, I had expected some sort of supplication, pleas, requests, appeals to good nature, etc. Instead, what I saw was a language of the share, which was quite surprising and not something that the prevailing literatures on clientelism, citizenship, etc., had quite equipped me to face. Now again, you will recognize the exchanges between the villagers and the bureaucrat and the president's endorsement of the villagers' claim of a share, which resonate with contemporary discussions on cash transfers as a solution to the twin problems of wagelessness and joblessness. In the exchange above, uh, you can throw in automation for good measure. And you've seen the logics and the arguments that have been given by the different um, uh, individuals. Now, what I find interesting from the point of view of imagining the possibility of an inclusive development future is the notion of a share that is dealing from such themes as production, labor, and taxation. And of course, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program is a massive program. It has an outlay of approximately $8 billion, uh, about a third of the World Bank's annual outlay. Um, and you know, it's been, it was designed to um, sort of ameliorate rural poverty uh, and agrarian distress in response to poor people's political practices and pressures. Um, but despite its Keynesian inspiration, it's quite clear that the program is no mere stopgap measure to deal with some periods of extreme distress. It's here to stay. And it has outlived the Congress government's being in power and India is currently ruled by a right-wing uh, government, which has not seen the need to dismantle the program. Yeah, in fact, it's quite happy to uh, sustain it. Now, India is not unique in instituting such a large uh, scale uh, workfare program. Um, around the same time, uh, Brazil under President Lula considered and consolidated its plethora of welfare assistance um, to its flagship conditional cash transfer, the Bolsa Familia. China too was innovating its Devao program to guarantee minimum living standards. And it was somewhat ironic that the three countries touted to be among the bricks of the global economy, hailed as rising powers, celebrated as leading emerging markets, the poster children, so to speak, of uh, neoliberalism were increasing rather than decreasing their social spending, that favorite bugbear of fiscal conservatives. In all of these countries, as some of us have uh, sort of tried to show um, alongside uh, political sociologists such as Ardem Yorok, uh, some of my own work, uh, these states were compelled to respond to poor people's claims for a share in the national wealth. Uh, the five largest tax funded social assistance programs in the world provided by China, India and Brazil currently reach 486 million people. These are all non contributory transfers and then we can sort of in the question and answer I can expand if you like on the you know the coverage of these uh, programs in their individual uh, countries, but these are quite huge they're pretty substantial and. Um, reach out to significant proportions of their country's population. Their annual expenditures on social protections alone outstrip the World Bank's total outlays per annum. Now, I must 
acknowledge here, of course, um, a debt to James Ferguson's notion of a rightful share in his uh, book, um, Give a Man a Fish. But I think uh, Ferguson links up the language of shares with the language of rights, and he talks about a rightful share. Um, I'm not sure, so sure about the idea of a rightful share, because as I said, the logic of rights did not seem to permeate at all in, in, in the claims that were being made. Um, but I do think that this notion of share delinked from the language of rights suggests possibilities for imagining inclusive development futures that in some ways exceed the promise of rights. I also want to push the point further and hear what the president of the village council said about presence is key. My interlocutors in rural Bihar were clearly thinking about a share that was also dealing from such conceptions as membership and belonging to a political community. The villagers existed and that was enough. Not only for them to claim a share, but also for their president to endorse their claims. One evening over drinks, the bureaucrat whispered to me that many of the workers who had complicated his life were probably not even Indian. Have you seen the way they tie their lungi, he asked me, referring to the sarong that the men wore. Here he was insinuating that the workers were Bangladeshi Muslims who had illegally infiltrated into India from India's eastern neighbor. When I broached this possibility with the president, he dismissed it with a wave of hand. That's a fanciful claim, he laughed. And anyway, how does it matter? They are here now. They live here, they work here, they're present here. In Hindi. It's going to be a headache to get rid of them. So he's not inspired by ideas of community and moral solidarity. It's just going to be a headache to get rid of them. Best to give them a share and get on with things. Now the politics of presence and this kind of an uncomfortable presence, not really a welcome presence, but a presence that everyone must just, you know, live with, so to speak, is a theme to which numerous scholars of the global south have returned. Ethnographic accounts provided by researchers on urban politics, um, here I'm thinking of Asef Bayat, Abu Malik Simon, Bina Das, among others, testify to the importance of a politics of presence as quarters, as people waiting patiently in queues, as people who auto-construct homes to mimic official plans, the urban poor and the rural poor as well, make it a point to be present, not as revolutionaries on barricades, but as people going about their everyday lives and livelihoods waiting, as Arjuna Padurai tells us, to make their next move. So you can see the way in which a politics of presence might scaffold claims of a share. If you're present in a polity, irrespective of the status of your membership or belonging, irrespective of whether or not you pay tax, vote in a certain way or consume certain goods, you have a share. It doesn't matter whether you're native or immigrant, what matters is that you are present here, present among us. Now, I don't want to romanticize this situation. There is a great political economic churning uh, brought about by de-agrarianization and de-industrialization that lies at the heart of all of this. There are you know, significant power imbalances that I, uh, I am aware of, but I don't want to get into it simply because there are lots of other things I'd like to cover. I'm quite happy to come back to it if you have questions, uh, but I want to just signal that this is not a romanticization of poor people's struggles uh, and the very precarious existence that they live, but to draw attention to the fact that despite huge power asymmetries, well, people live. They they struggle and they continue to try and make the best that they can. Here, of course, one can throw in the whole uh, conversation around automation um, and the great decoupling that a lot of uh, scholars and writers are have referred to between human consciousness and human intelligence. Uh, and of course, here I'm referring to uh, discussions on artificial intelligence. The pandemic has made social distancing mandatory. So old ideas of work where people got together may no longer be um, with us. Um, and those are conversations to be had. It's just that I, I don't really want to go into them right now because they will require a great deal more um, of depth than what I, the time that I will have. 
but i want to end this segment with the with by flagging the idea of a share and the politics of presence because these claims of a share resonate well beyond the realm of work wages welfare and social transfers um to the realm of governance to the realm of power and sharing power the high caste bureaucrat's complaint about the emergence of what he described as the lower castes to power makes this obvious such claims are also evident from recent events in the global north which have foregrounded racial oppression and claims of historic injustice there are growing conversations at least in my field development studies international development about reparations from slavery and colonialism to be paid to the colonized peoples instead of thinking about aid trade and such uh, fixes throughout my field work people who identified themselves as high castes claimed time and again that the emergence of the low castes as politicians had disrupted the social order and had been catastrophic these exact processes were celebrated by people stigmatized as low castes for ushering in an era of ijjat a rural hindi term that loosely translates into dignity to convey the idea that every human being was worthy of respect irrespective of their social identity or status life choices opinions and economic condition in march 1990 lalu prasad yadav the son of a lower caste landless cowherd was elected chief minister of bihar state the same state that i was doing field work in yadav's party ruled bihar for a total of 15 years during those 15 years the state's social landscape was irrevocably transformed as narratives of dignity permeated the state's political lexicon yadav promised to ensure that everyone lived lives of dignity if this meant special attention to the poor the exploited and the marginalized in general to those who faced oppression under the twin forces of caste and capital then his administration would do so nearly a decade before the united nations mdgs declared their collective responsibility and i quote to uphold the principles of human dignity equality and equity poor peasants and landless laborers in north india were warming up to a politician who had made dignity a political issue Yadav's rise emboldened the so-called untouchables who now call themselves dalits a term to refer to them being oppressed in their claim for fair wages and respect from their high caste landlords they were also less willing to quietly acquiesce in their own exploitation and discrimination and more willing and able to retaliate against high caste mistreatment of their persons and properties throughout the 1990s when hindu nationalism engulfed india in violence between hindus and muslims yadav's government was remarkably effective in maintaining peace between the two communities chronicling his journeys in rural bihar at the turn of the millennium the writer and historian william dolrymple narrates this complaint by a high caste landlord landowner lalu the man says referring to the chief minister by his first name is always encouraging these low castes to rise up against us now they refuse to work for us his government will not protect us it is on their side the lower castes are rising up this is the kali yug he re laments referring to the epoch of disintegration in hindu cosmology everything is falling apart Dolrymple's interlocutor was understandably threatened by the upending of a familiar, cherished and beneficial social order. Not only were the lower castes asserting themselves, they were entering politics and occupying the state's legislature. Before 1990, Bihar's high castes, who were less than 20% of the population, controlled almost half the seats in the state legislature. That figure was considerably contained since Yadav came to power. Among his first actions was to enhance protective discrimination for the lower castes in public sector employment and governing bodies of key universities in the state. The government made it a criminal offence to violate the provisions of protective discrimination. If no suitable candidates from lower caste backgrounds could be found, the positions were to be kept vacant rather than filled by candidates from high castes. The legacy of protective discrimination has continued well after Yadav lost office. 
His rival and successor has now instituted a 50% quota as protective discrimination for women in the state's elected village councils. Now, as a state within the Indian Union, Bihar was, of course, tweaking the protective discrimination policies as provided for the national, for by the national constitution. The Indian constitution adopted way back in 1950, an elaborate system of protective discrimination called reservations in its national parliament and state legislatures, public sector employment and higher education for its Dalit population, those historically oppressed as untouchable. India also has similar protections in place for Adivasis, the equivalent of indigenous populations who have been variously stigmatized as primitive forest dwellers. Commensurate to their share of the national population, 22% of all seats are reserved for members of these communities, while the proportion varies from state to state depending on the local population. Similar protections are now widespread across several countries in the global south. South Africa instituted proportional employment schemes to balance the proportion of Blacks after the dismantling of apartheid in 1994 across municipalities, organizations of the state, and firms with over 50 employees. Brazil instituted quotas for Afro-Brazilians in public employment and higher education. China, Turkey, Mexico have all provisioned protective discrimination for ethnic and religious minorities in institutions of higher education. Nigeria's 1999 constitution mandated that its bureaucracy, legislature, and media represented the diversity of the country. Indonesia instituted protective discrimination to favor indigenous businesses in West Papua. And to be honest, some of the smaller countries of the global south, such as Nepal and Bolivia, have made even greater strides in ensuring that members of the marginalized communities in their countries have found representation in their national parliaments. Rwanda, which mandated 30% reservation for women in its national parliament, today boasts over 60% women legislatures. I think that's the highest in the world. Now, of course, as you can imagine, protective discriminations are not without controversy. They strike at the heart of liberal principles of equality and non-discrimination by positively discriminating in favor of certain groups based on their gender, ethnic, religious, regional, and potentially even economic identity where they have been anchored in nativist mobilization and ethnic chauvinism, as is often suggested in Malaysia, such discriminations can easily become negative rather than positive. But where they are justified on grounds of compensating for past injustices or present inequalities without recourse to majoritarian rhetoric and chauvinism or nativism and xenophobia, they can be mobilized for social inclusion. The practice has, in the Global South, tended more towards the latter. For example, an impassioned defense of protective discrimination for Afro-Brazilians was made by President Lula when he declared, we're not doing people favors. We're paying a debt built over 500 years. India's Prime Minister VP Singh responded to critics of protective discrimination on grounds of equality by telling them time and again, Treating unequals as equals is the greatest injustice. Now, such protective discriminations are very different from the affirmative action programs that we hear about in the US and in Europe, where the idea is anchored more in terms of equality um, and ensuring equality now uh, and ensuring that discrimination does not take place. Rather, in the Global South, there is a very positive thrust made towards discriminating in favor of people, groups, ethnicities who have been historically marginalized and oppressed. And we can come back to that discussion later in case you're wondering why I chose to use the word protective discrimination rather than affirmative action. Now in a political context where racial oppression is becoming an issue here in the global north, we can no longer ignore um, uh, the sorts of um, ideas from the global south, which have talked about protective discriminations. Now let's look at some figures. In the UK, um, BME communities are about 14% of the population, but make up about 10% of the national, uh, of the House of Commons. That's not too bad, you will say. 
In France, uh, ethnic minorities are about 15% of the population, but only about 6% of the uh, national parliament. In the United States, non-whites are about 40% of the population, but are less than 25%, about 22% of the house of um, whatever it is that the lower house is called in the US. If you contrast this with Nigeria, the Palestinian Authority, Bolivia, Colombia, Nepal, India, all of these countries have in place systems where religious and ethnic minorities are represented in their parliaments in as a proportion of the population. Now, theorists of representation have tended to balk at calls for such descriptive representation. And of course, there's Hannah Pitkin's very famous uh, sort of case against descriptive representation. But as Anne Phillips, um, the feminist theorist of representation has reminded us, descriptive representation may not after all be a bad thing. It might not be revolutionary, and I agree, but it is at least a starting point to acknowledge that people of diverse backgrounds, especially those who have suffered historic injustice and or social marginalization, have a share in power and governance. And across these countries in the global south, wherever there have been discussions on protective discriminations, the idea has been to ensure that people have a share in power and a share in governance, as well as the responsibilities of running the country. Now, a share in power and governance to shape the global order is perhaps what the BRICS and other countries of the global south can be expected to claim. And here I want to move to the third and last part of my uh, talk. Now, not for nothing are the BRICS considered a challenge. Um, of course, you've had countries in the past with very rapid economic rates of growth, Japan, South Korea. You've had countries in the past with very, uh, uh, you know, with, with great military prowess, um, the USSR. But the BRICS have registered growth rates that are higher than that of the global north, and they make up about 40% of the world's population. So their claim is to a share in global governance and think back to what the third world wants, uh, the comment that I made earlier. They've ensured through a politics of presence, for instance, the funding of new multilateral development banks, the new development bank, uh, the Asian infrastructure uh, uh, investment bank, that they cannot be ignored. Indeed, China's multi-trillion dollar Belt and Road Initiative has stamped its presence across three continents. Um, India, Brazil, and South Africa have established something called the IPSA Fund to support smaller scale social development programs. The New Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank together provide alternative sources of development finance to the Global South. And you have, as Emma Maudsley's sorry, Emma Maudsley's work shows, new forms of South-South cooperation that have upended the dominance of the global North in development assistance, while retaining the narrative of post-colonial solidarity of the oppressed. This has been quite clearly evidenced in the ongoing pandemic. The pandemic illustrated several instances, not only of South-South cooperation, but also assistance from the global North, sorry, also assistance from the global South to the global North. And of course, despite its own complicity in the diffusion of the pandemic, China quickly emerged as a donor to embattled nations in Europe, including Italy, France, Greece, the Czech Republic, and Serbia. And some of the aid was dubious, no doubt, but the narrative is really uh, interesting. Uh, Chinese philanthropist Jack Ma uh, donated much needed equipment to countries in Europe and the US. And Ma's announcement on Twitter donating 100 million masks to the World Health Organization contrasted with the then US President uh, Trump's threatening to end US contributions to that body. But there were instances of South South cooperation that um, were, uh, you know, that. You had lots of instances. I don't want to go into each of them now, but I've written a bit on this. I'm very happy to share uh, more links if you like. But what's important is that the pandemic appears to have challenged the global North's dominance in global governance. 
It painfully revealed the vulnerability of the West in protecting its own populations against COVID. Um, but it also unmasked China's doublespeak and dented that country's credibility, perhaps beyond repair. And what it did perhaps is to show that the global South needed neither the West nor China in their national battles against a global pandemic. Rather, countries across the global South demonstrated that they could step up to meeting their share of responsibilities during a raging pandemic, while the US and China engaged in bickering, what about re and worse. Now, like the bureaucrat in North Bihar, many people in the global North will be undoubtedly uncomfortable with the upending of a comforting, familiar, and to them, beneficial global order. In exactly the same way as the high caste bureaucrat or landlord in rural India suspects every move by low caste politicians, so will perhaps the established powers of the global north look upon the BRICS with suspicion. The BRICS would of course be expected to push for reform of global governance, often in their own favor. However, in order to convince the global community that they intend being truly inclusive, they will have no option but to embrace agendas for reform that benefit the wider family of nations. Like Lalu Prasad Yadav, the lower caste chief minister of Bihar who crafted political alliances with the state's oppressed communities, Dalits and Muslims, the BRICS too will have to seek alliances with the countries of the third world, global south, or whatever else it is that they choose to call themselves. So what might we learn from the ideas of the share and the politics of presence when we think of the future of the global order? One idea might be to foreground oppression in reflecting on reforming global governance. The global south is 88% of the world population, yet it has no say in the Security Council. And one can argue whether China is really global south or not. When one thinks about reforms in global governance and thinks of the, uh, of the time when bodies such as the Security Council are expanded, perhaps think not only of the largest countries or the ones with the most military or economic prowess that are invited, but to think of the share of poorer countries and poorer peoples as having a share in global governance some sort of welfare transfers as shares and protective discrimination will have to be thought of as we reflect on the coming global order. The language of shares means we have to get away from such ideas as aid and charitable giving to think about what it means to be present in the global community. The language of shares also means we have to think about such things as you know, making small committees in which you want to uh, involve uh, uh, the least developed countries and give them a more meaningful role in global governance. I want to end there. This is not a conclusion, but it's more an invitation to have your comments and perhaps criticisms to help me think through this argument more. But thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Indrajit. That was fantastic. It was a very, very good uh, discussion. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you uh, hugely. So I think this notion of share is very, very powerful, isn't it? And trying to think about um, the way in which we would have to share the world differently, mm -hmm. share responsibilities, share power, mm -hmm. share resources, and, and how for how long that world has not been shared in, in any way that's been equal. And, and, and so to do so would be uh, a massive undertaking, really. If we could even begin to make a small step in the right direction, it would be quite something. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what you think. I mean, I've been very struck by uh, the way in which there are very powerful for forces mo still moving against this, for example, whatever China has been doing, and I'm not going to defend China's position or role, but um, the, uh, the, the kind of discussion that's gone on about China during the pandemic has, has been a kind of concerted attack, not on China's role in the pandemic, but on China's role in the world, and, an, and, a, and a very strong attempt to undermine that. And so, um, and I wondered if you could sort of say a little bit about what you 
you think about China, because of course with Joe Biden coming into the presidential office yesterday, there's some sort of idea that things will right themselves. But I actually think that the, the chances of global governance sorting themselves out between the United States and China don't look very bright, even with the re-emergence of Jack Ma yesterday, amazingly, <laughs> and not surprisingly, right? <laughs> So I just wondered if you might say a little bit about just about China before we get going into the more general thing about sharing, because it is such a big issue for global governance right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I completely uh, see your point and, um, I, I, and, and I would sort of endorse it. You know, you don't want to let China off the hook, but you do have to be careful about the way in which China has been portrayed, not in the context of the pandemic, which is one aspect of, you know, the conversations around China, but this whole talk about China planning to take over the world, so to speak, yeah. and, you know, imposing its own new variant of the Middle Kingdom and, you know, all of the Mandate of Heaven stuff. Um, I think it's, in, in a way, that's exactly what strikes me as being so similar to uh, Dalrymple's high caste land landowner sort of complaining about how the world was disintegrating, how, you know, it was Kali Yuk, the whole idea of, you know, the epoch where uh, social order was no longer sort of, you know, the way it used to be. Mm. Um, I, I do think some of it is um, sort of worries that the rise of China means the decline of the West. Mm. Um, and of course, status is always relative, isn't it? Um, yeah. The moment you think about the rise of somebody and you think about it in terms of status, uh, somebody's rise is always going to mean somebody else's decline. Yes. Um, and that is, I have to say, you know, inevitable. Um, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound defeatist or I don't want to sound even realist as, as in terms of the, you know, the IR subschool. Um, but I, I, I I think a lot of the talk around China in the West is overplayed. Mm. I think there is an overestimation of the Chinese government's capacity mm -hmm. uh, to plan anything like, you know, a world takeover. Yes. Um, I, I think there is an overestimation of China's, um, you know, great power sort of ambition uh, or, or, or certainly capacity. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative has so often been talked about as a plan for world takeover. But anyone who's familiar with how the Belt and Road Initiative has actually emerged will tell you that it's really a patchwork quilt of various small scale infrastructure programs that have been quickly cobbled together to show that this is one huge program. And of course, this is something that benefits the Chinese establishment as well as those in the West who would sort of like to talk about China as this uh, great power which is about to overthrow uh, things. So my response after this long winded sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, monologue is really that China's presence is real. It's not something we can run away from. There are things that the Chinese government and the Chinese people are doing which certainly is in the interests of China, um, but it's also in the interests of others. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that um, you can't wish China away. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's about time we welcome China, recognize that there are issues with the way in which China deals with uh, things like the pandemic, things like uh, human rights violations in Western and Southern China, but also recognize that um, you know there are there are many Chinas, so to speak. Don't take too uh, too strongly the view of one China that the Chinese Communist Party would like us to believe. There are several Chinas, and one has to sort of engage with those several Chinas. Yes, I agree, and I think I think I think actually the depiction of China in the West is very often a scandal. Um, um, Absolutely, yes, because. We're talking about a country, you know. If we if we don't look at sort of issue, these issues that are that are constantly peddled in the Western press, you know, just think, for example, of China's contribution to scientific endeavor or to medical discovery, um, and, and of course, same for India too. But I mean, the you know the enormous importance of of the intellectual endeavor of of what goes on in China and the um, you know the and, and and the you know the art the artistic work, I mean, all sorts of things that we could talk about, but we, but those things are never mentioned, of course. And of course it raises an interesting issue then about, 
you know, how, how willing are the old guard to share, do you think? I mean, so sharing is a very important notion that you've talked about, but how willing are these old guard to share? It seems to me that the West may be in its death throes, but they're holding on pretty hard at the moment. Yeah, I think um, the, to, to me, there are two parts to your question. Um, so yes, the West may, may not be very willing to share, but they will, in, 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 a, in a way, they will have no choice. They have to share. They are on the death throes, as you said, and their best bet might be to actually try and engage with China so that they continue to have a stake in the order that is yet to come. Mm. But I think the real threat or the real problem for China will be really its neighbors in Asia. Mm. And I have to say the Chinese government hasn't done itself any favors with it sort of, you know, showing itself as one coherent power, because of course, the moment you do that, the ones to fear you most are not people in the faraway West, but in but people in your immediate neighborhood. South China Sea, yeah, yeah. The South China Sea, China's relations with India, China's relations with Japan, with its neighbors in Central Asia, perhaps even Russia. I think the key really for China and thinking about sharing is really for China to, you know, to, to come clean, so to speak, in terms of saying that they are the ones who are interested in sharing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have said it, but I think, you know, ideas of a harmonious coexistence, you know, they, 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 sound, they sound a little, a little odd uh, for a lot of China's uh, neighbors. But I think there have to be very, very clear uh, sets of um, ideas uh, put forward by the Chinese um, Communist Party, the Chinese government, by the different actors within China, many of whom are not under the control of the CCP, as we are led to believe, uh, right. who may well be willing to sort of, you know, reflect more on how you share the world's resources. Um, I, I do think uh, China's sort of presence in, you know, forums such as, um, you know, of course, climate change and WTO has usually been more sort of towards sharing rather than trying to dominate. Uh, very progressive, very often, and very progressive. Um, but um, I think they have to do more of that, not less. Um, and so to me, the real challenge that China faces is not from the West, but its own neighbors in Asia. And I will not be surprised if there is some sort of an arrangement to share between the West and China, but not between China and its own neighbors. And that, that'll of course be, be the twist in the tale. Yes, that's, it's a very interesting thought. But, but I'm also quite persuaded by the kinds of arguments that have been made recently, which said that if the 20th century was a time of conflict between countries with two world wars and many, many, many other conflicts, especially post-colonial post conflicts or conflicts for, against colonial powers, that actually the conflict of the 21st century is going to be within these nations. There's a kind of fissipariousness within all these nations. And so we see this in the securitization of the American president's inauguration. We see it in uh, what's going on in Ukraine, we see it in um, what's happening in Belarus. I mean, so we have, we have this idea that, you know, and indeed in Catalonian independence and, you know, all of those things that we've, which we're all familiar with. So, I mean, what do you think about the, the sort of actual, the sharing that's going on within nations at the moment? Um, again, I mean, that's a, a very useful point to think on. And I suppose, you know, when I, when I talk of new development futures, inclusive futures is one aspect and exclusive futures is exactly its sort of corollary. Um, and you're right, I think, uh, you know, when one thinks about such issues as inequality, um, global inequality, especially, you know, we are told that although you see a global convergence in terms of inequality, uh, the world is becoming more equal countries are actually becoming more unequal. So yeah. internally, you have, you know, great deal of um, inequalities, both economic as well as social, and also the sorts of um, conflicts and contradictions that you pointed to. And I think this is in some ways, um, really at the heart of the new development futures, this, this coming together of, you know, certain inclusive tendencies with certain exclusivist tendencies. Because of course, you know, what do these, uh, what do these conflicts suggest? They, they suggest on the one hand that there is a problem in the sharing of resources, 
Mm -hmm. But they also suggest, on the other hand, that people expect to those resources to be shared. Mm. Whereas in the past, they might have gotten away, the, the elites, those in power may have gotten away by cornering resources yeah. because the others may not have expected a share. And that expectation is now undermined. I mean, there is an expectation that resources will be shared. There is an expectation in India that uh, among Muslims that they will be treated as equal by the Hindu majority. Mm -hmm. um, and when that expectation is not met, there is bound to be a challenge. Uh, there is an expectation among Dalits and lower castes in India that they will be treated as equals. And of course, that expectation is not met. Uh, or if it is met, then those in power feel threatened. Um, likewise, the majorities and minorities in um, you know, parts of the world where you have ethnic or religious uh, tension. So I, I think your comment is actually very useful to me to think about how the idea of the share and how the expectation that things will be shared actually leads to both inclusion and exclusion. And they are in some ways two sides of the same, of the exact same coin, which to me doesn't mean that we should stop talking about sharing because yeah, I, I think we should. It's, it's just to be aware that conversations on sharing will entail conflict. And I suppose to be, to be, to be prepared for it. Um, I do take the sort of what in what my political philosopher colleagues call the agonistic sort of view of politics, uh, which is not outright sort of annihilation of the enemy or, you know, liquidation of the opponent, uh, but also not a harmonious sort of assimilation into a liberal polity. There are these tensions, there are these conflicts which we have to um, face up to, um, and we we can't help it. Uh, annihilation, liquidation, separation is not is not a solution. No, it's not a solution. So we so, have to have disagreement without annihilation. That's that's very that's yeah. very. And 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 we might have disagreements that spill out onto the streets, uh, mm -hmm. and you might have these. So and I don't want to romanticize these sorts of things we saw in the capital, but you might have scenes like that. Um, you know, which we just have to face up to, uh, and we have to sit and talk. In a sense, I think the the, the village president's comment of the headache is 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 quite pertinent. Pertinent, you know, you will have headaches. We will all have headaches. We just have to have lots and lots of aspirin ready with us. <laughs> Very good, Indrajit. So I now need to open a little bit to the floor because I can see that <clears throat> the questions are coming towards me, which means that uh, that we're, I'm having too much fun talking to you and I should cede to the floor a bit. So the first question is from uh, uh, Jackie McGlade, who's a professor in the IGP, and she's saying, Immigrants who came to DRC from Rwanda and Uganda were initially given employment and accepted by local villagers and tribes but a large mistake was made when the British local administration got involved in linking sharing with citizenship, which did not take into account the older tribal cross-border alliances. And inevitably the, wall, the wars in DRC were exacerbated by this. So what are your views on citizenship in terms of being present and the sharing of resources? Does one need to be a citizen? So. My, my short answer is no, no. But of course, that will invite the immediate question: Then, who who gets to yes. you know, who gets to share? And I think that's 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 open for exactly the sorts of historical analysis that um, you you know have have just been mentioned. You know, yeah. thinking about how ideas of a share that was about humanity, or or may, maybe not even abstract notions of humanity, but just the fact that somebody is here, what do you do with them? It's like the annoying brother who sort of comes and decides to plonk themself, himself on your sofa. You know, you, you can't evict him, but you yeah. sort of just stay with him and you grumble a bit and then you get on with making breakfast. I mean, I, I'm sure brothers are very good. Mine is very good if he's listening, but I, I, I mean, generally, you know, that's the sort of, um, uh, attitude that I think has, um, you know, you know, is more realistic to expect, and it's it's a question of I think empirical investigation in terms of when those fairly open-ended attitudes were restricted mm 
through colonial practices, which by the way, have continued in post-colonial times. So I very much recognize the ways in which colonial forms of governance were responsible for erecting these walls in the name of citizenship mm -hmm. and other ideas of membership. Um, but we also have to face up to the fact that they continued, they were continued by post-colonial governments. Um, and so I think what we really have to do, um, again, this calls to mind the whole notion of the post-colonial predicament, you know, how colonial practices continue long after countries have formally decolonized. But how can you think beyond um, those categories of membership and belonging that were uh, introduced by colonial powers or that came into being during colonial rule. I mean, I don't want to give the colonial powers too much agency either, but you know, they, 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 they were certainly there and they, they presided over this sort of nonsense that uh, sort of uh, happened. Yeah. Um, and how can we think beyond those sorts of categories, um, I think is a question that based on the historical investigation we have to uh, I suppose, have these conversations with uh, the political philosophers, the political scientists, and the anthropologists. But I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that comment because I think it does suggest that it's not naive or utopian to think about sharing uh, with your neighbors or people who are immigrants, uh, et cetera, and that we've done that in the past and there's no reason we can't do it in the future. Yeah, I agree. And now we have a question from Paul Stevens and he's asking, to what extent do you think the binary North versus South is a barrier to our analysis and understanding of development futures and global prosperity? I think of the prosperity for some people and technological advances in, for example, parts of India and China in the South, which equals anywhere in the world and the poverty and discrimination in, for example, in the US, uh, in the global North, which also equals anywhere in the world. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, I think it's a fascinating question. And my short answer is, and if you asked me this question about a couple of years ago, my answer would have been, it is a barrier. Mm. Uh, if it is taken too rigidly. Mm. And if it is taken in a way to suggest that, well, the North must teach the South, mm. or the North must sort of be the font of knowledge. Um, and so I would say, given the processes that have just been mentioned, that the boundaries between the two are considerably blurred. Um, and that there is a lot to be learned thanks to connected knowledges between the North and the South. So as long as the North doesn't take on itself the, the role of the provider and the font of knowledge, of inspiration, of ideas, um, you know, and the South as a recipient, um, I think to, to the extent that you know, those, those hierarchies, um, uh, you know, are being questioned. I think the, the continued existence of North and South can be a problem. Mm. Mm. But I do have to say that there is still value in talking about the North and the South, just in the way that I suppose there is a value in talking about, you know, specific kinds of categories, even though you want to eliminate discrimination between them. And I'm thinking about categories around gender, around race, yeah. around ethnicity. You, we cannot ignore the histories of exploitation or marginalization or oppression that have happened and that continue to shape the present in the way that your colleague mentioned just before in the case of the DRC and you know how there are certain sorts of practices that were brought in uh, by colonial powers. So I think the value of thinking about global north versus global south lies in its in, in, in thinking about the ways in which certain countries have emerged mm. as dominant and certain countries have been subordinated. Mm. I don't think there's a great deal of descriptive um, value, but I think there is a sort of historic analytic value which we must hold on to. I am entirely sympathetic to the sort of need to blur boundaries. Uh, I have, um, I, 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 I must say, since it's come up, I have a project where I'm looking at the politics of hope uh, in three global cities. Uh, and I'm looking at London, Paris, and Mumbai. 
And the idea really is to blur the boundaries between the North and the South. There are um, you know, instances of poverty and uh, uh, inequality in the global North, which are probably worse than anything you might see in the global South. Um, but recognizing those internal problems and hierarchies doesn't mean that we pretend that colonialism didn't exist. And sometimes, I'm not saying uh, this, uh, this question is sort of hinting at that, yes, yes. Going towards that, but sometimes that's the tendency. Um, in, in works to say, ah, you know, don't bother with global north and south, we are all equal. We are not, and we weren't, certainly we weren't. No, no, it's a very, very important point. And I think also important, again, going back to the internal thing that we were talking about, I was very struck by something somebody reminded us of during the presidential um, election process in the United States, which is, you know, when people were talking about the southern states of America being many of them predominantly Republican up to this moment, mm -hmm. others were saying, no, these were never really Republican states. These were oppressed states. So there was no registration of the black vote. Yes. So, you know, yes. that's really, <clears throat> again, one of those things to think about is that, you know, how these categories you know, Republican, Democrat, North, South play out and what their particular histories are. They work on exclusion, of course, themselves. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And I, I, and I would really endorse that point. We do have to recognize these internal, internal colonizations, if you want to call it that, or internal hierarchies or internal histories of subjugation or oppression. But we cannot run away from the fact that the US you know, or, you know, did all the things it did in the world, Iran or uh, Latin America or China or, where, you know, wherever else, all the things that it did in the world is a, is a mark of power and dominance uh, of the United States as people, maybe not of the Southern voters who were, or people who were exempt from voting, but of the United States as a political category and all of those who supported it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's I, I completely sympathize with that, but I have to I, I and I suppose given my own, I, you know, origin in the globe in India, you know, where we, we, we take our anti colonialism very seriously, I, if you will, you know, it's it's not something I, 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 I am I'm yet willing to discard. But good. Okay, well, no, this is good. Um, so the next question is from Joshua Williams, and he's asking you, do you expect a more inclusive world where we will see a move towards multilateral trade deals governing trade and away from the WTO? Do you have a view about the WTO? Um, so the WTO, of course, is, is a very interesting beast. Um, it has uh, its origins in some, you know, fairly, uh, you know, one would say exclusivist uh, ideas about trade and intellectual property rights. Uh, but it's also a place where um, countries like India and Brazil have, you know, famously got along and, you know, were able to sort of uh, outmaneuver the, the old court, so to speak. And, you know, they, uh, as I'm sure, you know, you know, in, in terms of, you know, going against a lot of what the US and the EU wanted to do, and they were able to get the backing of many countries in the global south uh, for them in a way that they then emerged as a headache uh, for the global north. Um, so so to, to respond to your question, I think the issue really is thinking about occupying existing institutions rather than necessarily calling for, you know, new kinds of multilateralism. Obviously they are more than welcome. Hmm. Um, I'm given the gridlock that exists in a lot of existing sort of, um, uh, frameworks of global governance, which so many uh, you know, scholars have uh, mentioned, it's going to be a headache. Oh. I'm not terribly uh, uh, sort of uh, hopeful of new, very inclusive kinds of multilateralism emerging on their own, mm -hmm. but I do realize, and I do think that we are going to have new kinds of multilateralism. Whether they're inclusive or not is a second part of the sort of question. We are going to have new kinds of multilateralism, uh, but I think they're more likely to be trilateral or quadrilaterals rather than multilaterals in, in the sense that the term yeah. is usually yeah. understood. Yeah. Yeah. I refer to the India, Brazil, South Africa fund. Now it's a tiny fund. Um, I, I, you know, they, I, I, I don't think it's more than a hundred thousand pounds a dollars a year that they spend, but you know, it is an attempt to get together to do 
something uh, for other developing countries. How inclusive is that is anybody's guess, um, especially when you limit your sort of governance to three countries. Um, you have something called the, um, you know, you have the various regional development banks, which are of course multilateral institutions that are regional, regionally specific. Mm -hmm. Again, how inclusive they are is anybody's uh, guess. Um, so my response to your question is twofold. Yes, there will be more multilateralism. I'm not sure how inclusive they necessary, necessarily will be. I think the safe thing to say is that they will probably provide alternatives to existing uh, borrowers or grantees. And that is always a good thing. I mean, I, I in, in, you know, more competition, and I don't want to sound neoliberal here, but in general, more competition is probably not a bad thing. So if you have alternatives to the World Bank or alternatives to the new development bank. Yes, I can see, I can, I can see that. So, <coughs> excuse me, we now have a question from Sertash Selikoglu, who is one of my colleagues at the IGP. And Sertash is on the panel, so she can ask you herself since she's just coming live now. Sertash, please. Um, Thank you, um, Henrietta, and um, thank you, um, Indrajit. It's such a fascinating talk. Um, I had a number of notes, but I'll ask a very kind of specific um, question. I know your work is um, very conscious about going beyond like particular narratives that are not helpful, and you specifically focus on going beyond Eurocentric and what you call elite-centric narratives of development. And I think, um, especially while we are trying to understand the context like South Asia and the Middle East, it's quite crucial to follow such a perspective. I mean, a number of anti-colonialist movements might entail elite elements and not being aware of those elements uh, would not get us to the point where we want to get, obviously. So I think, I think I'd like to ask you to open this up a little bit in relation to your talk. Um, yeah, I mean, I did notice a number of elements you have covered uh, that were linked, um, including the way you highlighted dignity along with well-being, right? But I just wanted to kind of ask this directly to kind of hear a little bit more. Thank you. Great. No, thank you. I think um, I think that's very useful, um, uh, especially given the post-colonial context that we are talking about. Um, uh, and if we look back at the history of uh, the recent history of some of these of some of the claims that were made on the liberal order by the, uh, you know, the newly independent countries. And we can think about such forums like the Bandung Conference or the non-aligned movement or the demands for the new international economic order, uh, you know, that raged through the 1970s. Of course, there's the element of elites and domestic national elites who were at the forefront of these demands. But I think the reason I want to go or I support those scholars who go beyond elite centric views is that we often think about elites as if they were acting of their own volition. And we ignore the sorts of pressures that they were put to by their own constituents. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, Mustafa Kamal in Turkey, or whether it's Pandit Nehru in India, or Chawen Lai, or Sukarno, it's of course great to look at names, and it's always helpful, because then you can pin down actors, and these are influential actors, I mean, these were charismatic politicians, all of them, but at the end of the day, we have to recognize that they were politicians who were not only creating something, but also responding to, uh, some, you know, certain kinds of demands. Um, it's it's quite fascinating, you know, to when you think about uh, some of the positions that countries like India uh, took at in in you know uh, in international forums. It's quite in, easy to think about them as all being Nehru's gift to Indians, but of course that's rubbish because Nehru was responding constantly to so the kinds of pressures that emerged on his Congress party that emerged from a variety of domestic interests, you know, farmers, laborers, there was a, there was a communist insurrection in, on his hands and he had no option but to take a firm position um, through the 1950s and the 60s because of course there was always the fear that, you know, the Congress would be swept away by the left-wing uh, sorts of insurrection. So he had to sort of play uh, 
a twofold game. He had to obviously contain the left wing extremists, as he put it. He also had to keep the right wingers at bay, but he also had to sort of, you know, negotiate with with the dominant power. So I, I find that interplay fascinating. I'm of course not suggesting elites are not important. I mean that 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 would be that would be mindless. Um, but I think going beyond elite centrism, I'd like to bring into focus the relations between elites and non-elites. I guess that's 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 what I'd like to uh, contribute to. Um, we. You're right. Often we draw a distinction between elites and you know the poor, or elites and um, uh, the, the group of people called subalterns. I mean, you know, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, the idea of the subaltern is you know has a you know revered sort of uh, genealogy. Uh, I don't want to pretend that elites and subalterns exist in two mutually exclusive worlds. Uh, I think they do relate. They do interact. What I am uncomfortable with is pretending that it's elites who take all the decisions of their own volition and uh, who, who are insulated from pressures from below. Uh, the welfare programs that I mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, it's very easy to talk of them as the result of what Ardhyan did or Dr. Manmohan Singh did or what you know, X, Y, or Z did, what Lula did. Um, but I'm not sure that's terribly helpful because, of course, they did it. They were the you know in charge of their countries, but they were responding to um, pressures from urban slums in Istanbul or uh, favelas in Sao Paulo or villages in Central India. You know, there was they they, they had uh, full scale sorts of uh, insurrections on their hands, both left and right, and they had to sort of respond to those um, demands from below. And I think. My, my response to, to my short response to your question is I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that elites were not important. I, I think they are, but I think we do have to recognize the role of uh, subordinate groups in pushing some of these very, very important uh, claims. The whole claim for protective discriminations certainly doesn't emerge from elites, at least in the context that um, uh, you know, I've uh, looked at. Um, in India, the Congress elites were absolutely against any kind of protective discrimination. And it's subaltern politicians like the chief minister of Bihar state that I mentioned, who really sort of pushed for, um, and who and his party, you know, pushed for things like protective discriminations. Um, in Brazil, I understand the situation being a little different. Uh, Lula was very sympathetic to uh, uh, affirmative act, to protective discriminations. Um, but again, there's just so much going on, which uh, gets, uh, which miss, which we miss out if we only focus on those at the top. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we've got lots of <clears throat> Indra. You've got very people very excited, so we've now got more questions coming. So the next one is uh, from Ala Shahabi, who is a colleague in, of mine in the IGP. And she's saying the biggest crisis, arguably bigger than the pandemic that the world faces, is climate change. And this necessitates accountability and responsibility. Could you elaborate your thesis on shares for the debate on uh, global house gas emissions, carbon pricing, which is mired in the disagreement between the global north that has historically caused the major share of greenhouse gas emissions vis-a-vis -vis the global south desire to continue with its industrial development? Yeah. Um, I mean, again, it's it's such a fascinating question that I'm actually scared to venture there, partly because I am it's it's not as as I would say, it's not an area of my competence. And I'm sure there are so many people in the room who would, you know, who would who would know more than me. But I think in terms of the general principle of share and in terms of the politics of presence, and here I suppose one could talk about the politics of the presence of whatever particles it is that are up there that were caused by historic emissions. <laughs> and I, I, I was listening to someone who said, uh, you know, the CO2 particles or whatever particles it is that were emitted during the Industrial Revolution are, are still there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very, very, to me, very clear who has to um, sort of bear the brunt, if you will. But let's be very clear also that it is about sharing the planet, not only with those who are present, 
but those who came before us and those who will come after us. So in that sense, you're absolutely right that uh, we do have to think between the global north and the global south, retaining those categories. We do have to think about what's the best way to, uh, to, to share the responsibilities. Um, the global north has to face up to what it has done. And I think uh, some of Professor Moore's own work, you know, around the, the model Scandinavian sort of countries will uh, get us to be careful about generalizations. Um, but I think also we have to, the global south has to recognize that it cannot follow the footsteps of the global north. It simply cannot. It's just, it's, it's, it's not fair, if you will, and I don't want to bring another concept of fairness into it, but it's, it's just, it's not possible. It's just not possible. And if we are sharing the planet with those who come after us, um, we do have to do things differently. So I'm afraid it's going to be a very wishy-washy answer because I'm tiptoeing across lots of, um, you know, competing uh, positions. But I do think that there is an element of historic responsibility that the global north cannot escape from. There is the element of who we are sharing with in the future. And, you know, if, if the global south is to share responsibility for governance, uh, and if the global south is keen to sort of sit atop the new global order, um, it's uh, it's something that they have to they have to take uh, more uh, seriously uh, their own role uh, and limiting the role of uh, present emitters in the global south and ensuring that they they do their bit. Mm. In practice, it may not be as problematic as some of the elites of the global south make it out to be because you do have new technologies um i suppose the question will be on things like intellectual property rights um you know what sorts of technologies are available and i mean my response to the any question of intellectual property rights is quite simple in in some ways if it is an emergency uh and the climate crisis is an emergency uh, then if you have new technologies, they must be made available to everyone. They must be shared. Um, in a bit like the way in which India and South Africa are pushing for at the WTO to ensure that, you know, vaccines and all sorts of res responses to the pandemic are made available to all, that intellectual property rights are suspended. In a similar way, I suppose, one should make the case that given that the climate crisis is a crisis, it's an emergency, uh, that technologies that are green and clean uh, should be made available to all, uh, irrespective of who produces them. Um, and one probably has to think about suspending intellectual property rights on them. And of course, this will invite the counter as to why should anybody bother to, uh, you know, create new technologies if they're not going to um, sort of be able to patent them, but my response would be exactly the same. You know, if it is an emergency, if it is a crisis, and we all agree that it is a crisis, um, then both sides have to, well, I don't want to both side this, but, you know, the global north and the global south have to work together and put in their bid. Yes, I rather agree with that, I have to say. And uh, now we have a question from um, Christopher Harker, who's also a colleague of mine at the IGP, and he's asking, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the concept of presence is often discussed in terms of operating under the radar. So uh, by its quiet encroachment, Simone's endurance, Povinelli's camouflage. These ideas point to the importance of not appearing to the state or other governance institutions. So what does it mean for your concept of the share when many populations won't claim a share but may actually take it? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really useful um, sort of distinction about, uh, you know, making the claim on the share and actually taking it. Oh. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's only going to enrich any conversation. Um, I, I would say this, that while the whole logic of the sort of presence that um, uh, Bayat and Simone and you know others have suggested is you're quite right to operate under the radar, not be seen by the state. But of course, everyone knows that the, the, these people exist. The state knows that they exist. Um, they're a headache for the state. Uh, 
uh, but the state knows they exist. Now, the, they operate under the radar when it comes to things like taxation or being in the shadows and, you know, sort of being in, in what is called informal employment. Um, but uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the bureaucrats, the politicians, the, those in power know uh, the shanty towns when they see it. They know exactly who lives there. Um, they know the, the hawkers, the vendors, the you know, people who sit on the footpath selling trinkets. Uh, everyone knows they exist. Now, they are absent, as you say very correctly, they are under the radar when it comes to paperwork, when it comes to the bureaucracy. But of course, those human beings exist. Um, you, know, you drive to work, the bureaucrat drives to work in, his, in whatever fancy car that they might have. Um, and they, they know that uh, these, these, these individuals exist. Uh, her husband might buy vegetables from, from exactly those people uh, in the morning. Uh, of course, he will know that they exist, uh, but he will also sort of not invite more work on himself by trying to sort of, you know, file a paper. So I think it's a dance that both sides do. Uh, and I think the art of not seeing is something that we've, we probably need little more uh, work than has been done. So we, we know a great deal about how uh, the, the urban and the rural poor, uh, how they've mastered the art of not being seen by governments and not being legible by governments. But I think how bureaucrats have mastered the art of not seeing or at least seeing only when convenient uh, is also something we need more work on. So my response to you would be, um, I, 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 I don't think that the politics of presence necessarily means that these individuals are not seen by the state. They are seen by the state. It's just that the state does not or chooses to or simply realizes that it can't do anything. How many people uh, is the Egyptian government going to evict from uh, Cairo or uh, the Iranian government from Tehran? or uh, the state governments in India from the state capitals. It's, it's impossible. Now we have a question for you from, uh, from Matt Davis, who's a colleague also at the IGP, and Matt's on the panel, so he can ask you himself, and so here he is. Thanks, Henrietta, and thank you, Indrajit, for a, a fantastic talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I had loads and loads of notes and loads of questions, but I wonder if I might just quick ask you two sort of quick ones. The first um, was around uh, descriptive representation in government, which I think is it was really interesting and fascinating the way you've outlined so many um, uh, moves along those lines from various global South governments. And if, if in, we take sort of the, the European North American model, which is representation largely by geography or demography, I was just wondering if you could give us some more details on how some of these systems in other parts of the world actually operate and how they balance geography, demography with other forms of representation. Yeah. And then the second one is the question you teed up, you teed up very nicely for yourself, which was that you said you, you prefer the term uh, protective discrimination. And I perhaps have some ideas about why you, you like that. And I thought it was a fantastic term. But you explicitly said you don't know, uh, you don't use affirmative action, and we might ask you about that. So I thought I'd ask you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think it's one of the, obviously it moved, it, it worked, this move worked. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, if you can respond to the second one first, as in why yeah. protective discrimination and why not affirmative action. I think affirmative action, in, you know, it, it has a very specific history in the way in which uh, the Anglo-American world uh, would try and sort of respond to issues of discrimination, which is understandable, which is to sort of say that this is a claim for equality. This is about equality. Um, and it is actually about non-discrimination. So you want to very specifically affirm, you know, a certain set of processes that ensures that there is no discrimination. And I think that's the way in which the, the, the policy is worded in the, in, in, the, in the United States sort of documents and in the various legal judgments. So it is to affirm or to take action to affirm that there is no discrimination on the basis of you know, race, religion, et cetera. And that's fine, that's, that's absolutely understandable. But as the you know, histories across the world, I would say, not just in the global South, but it's across the world, it is, you know, this is nice, thank you, but the point is you cannot, you simply cannot 
fight discrimination by pretending it doesn't exist. And I think therefore, what actually happens in the US is of course some kind of protective discrimination, which is what leads to these sorts of tensions in expectations between those who you know, would challenge similar sorts of judgments. If you perhaps said very clearly that there are protective discriminations in place, and I can understand why it'll be difficult in the Anglo-American world to push through ideas which have uh, the word discrimination in them as if they were positive. Um, but unless you do that, you're not going to be able to face up to the existing discriminations um, you know, that exist. As uh, you know, politicians who have championed a, a protective discrimination in the global south have said time and again, um, the worst thing is to treat people who are unequal as if they were equals. Uh, and discursively, of course, it's it's fair. You know, we want to recognize everyone's equal moral worth, etc. That's that's great, but we do have to recognize that there are inequalities, and you cannot fight inequality by pretending that those who are on that hierarchy are are all all are all equal. So I think that's the reason I would say protective discrimination, and I would continue to use that. Um, some people have, uh, I think a lot of people say preferential treatment, uh, and that's a nice term as well, except that, again, I've, I've yet to come to terms with what preference means and you know treatment, whereas protective discrimination is at the same time provocative, as well as it's exactly the terms that are often used by several of those countries. And I think if you sort of go with the term that is, be, that is in place, I think it's, it's probably uh, more useful to my mind. Um, and so that brings me to the question about how countries in the Global South have actually sort of balanced out different, um, uh, you know, uh, sorts of uh, diversities and hierarchies. So I think uh, the Nigerian case is perhaps the easiest to start with because there, you know, there is a more or less overlap between ethnicity and geography. So there are certain groups who are based in certain parts of, of the country. And so it's, it's fairly easy to say that when it, when it comes to bureaucracies, when it comes to, uh, you know, judiciary, et cetera, there will be a representation geographically. Uh, politically, in terms of its parliament, uh, again, there are very clear sorts of, um, uh, uh, guidelines as to what the proportion should be in different regions. Uh, and so I think that sort of, you know, the equivalent of that would probably be if in the UK Parliament, uh, or in the UK House of Commons, you did, uh, uh, you know, uh, you mapped out, uh, you know, what the ethnic compositions of different regions, if, if you want to use that term, are. And then you say that in different, you know, that you will ensure descriptive representation along those regions and ensure that that is reflected uh, in, in the House of Commons. Uh, the other approach is, um, which I suppose builds off this, is the Indian approach, which is to say, well, this is the proportion, you know, Dalits are 14% of India's population, the ex-untouchables, they must have 14% representation in the parliament. Of course, where are they going to have that representation from? Because India follows a first past the post system, so it has to be territorial. Um, then you have the challenge of fixing which constituency it will be where you will get Dalits from. That's always a challenge because there are, to my mind, I think there is no constituency where Dalits are a majority. And of course, here is where the Indian state plays its hand and the, uh, the high castes in the in, who control the Indian state sort of you know, play their game because they usually, and this is, I mean, it, it's quite shameful actually, they usually allocate seats with Muslim majorities to Dalits. And in a sense, they sort of get that contradiction. Now that's shameful, but at least it ensures that Dalits do get represented in an unanticipated way, it does mean that Muslims have to vote for Dalits, which means that Dalits are, Dalit representatives often tend to be responsive to Dalit and Muslim questions. So this is not anticipated or intended by the Indian state, let me assure you, but that's what often happens. So you've had in the past often Dalit politicians who've championed Muslim causes which results in the kind of subaltern um, uh, alliance, which is often a headache to high castes and was not intended. But then that's an interesting way in which uh, they've gone about 
it. So if the UK were to do something like that in the House of Commons, then you probably sort of say, okay, you have 14% of your population as BME. And then you look at where you have large concentrations of BME people. Then it may be that there's no constituency where you have a majority of uh, BME uh, people, but you do have, you know, slightly largish sort of numbers and you al allocate those constituencies. You could do it in a rotational basis. So it's not that one constituency is stuck, stuck with a BME representative forever and you could sort of rotate it along. And that's something that, uh, again, they do. Uh, of course, the trick there is to ensure that, um, that a constituency is allocated to a category for at least two terms, because that's when you will be interested in doing something. If you know that I'm not going to be back no matter what I do, because next time, so I'm a BME politician, but the next time it'll be uh, uh, you know, open to competition, there's no chance I will be elected. Uh, I might not sort of be interested. I mean, th that's, the, that's the way the Indian state has sort of thought of. So I don't know, I'm sorry, it was a very detailed and a very involved response to your question, but I hope that that, that helped. No, that was the kind of details I was interested in. And, and as you were describing it, I realized we could go on forever and, and ever and ever oh. and give the permutations. It's, it, uh, but no, it's absolutely. It's really absolutely. Nice start for us to think through those challenges, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, you, you know, there's always this challenge about to protective discrimination. Oh, it concretizes ethnicity or it concretizes identity. The other challenge is, oh, well, these were colonial categories in the first place. You know, why should we live with them? That's fine. You know, have categories of your own. If you wanted to introduce economy as a category or you wanted to introduce, you know, working classness, go ahead by all means, you know, if you wanted to introduce accent, go ahead by all means. I think what it does is to throw up the possibilities of ensuring that your representatives speak, look, think, well, not think is probably not right, but you know, you know, they, they, they represent their, their constituencies. Um, and I think um, it's, it's, it's quite uh, sort of interesting how conversations around protective discrimination get stuck to social identity, whereas there are lots of possibilities. Um, in the pre-independence era within India, you know, there were several princely states, so states that were not directly under Britain's control, but which were governed by local princes. Uh, they were obviously facing the same sorts of problems, uh, not only in terms of caste, but also class. So they would have representations along trade unions or industrial workers or farmers or landlords or landless, etc. You know, there were a variety of permutations. Um, again, because of the dominance of the colonial sort of regimes and categorizations, one set of ideas sort of got, you know, trumped the others. But again, it would be unfair to say it was the colonial government which innovated it. Uh, they took the idea from some of the princely states, and of course, it was easy for them to, you know, uh, popularize it across the board. But it also had the effect, the interject of... Uh... This, because we have to remember that the notion of reservation in India applies to things like university entrance mm -hmm. and a number of things. So that means that over time, you get actually uh, a sedimentation of, 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 of this process within the polity at large and within very different kinds of structure in the polity, which is wholly beneficial because you get it therefore, you know, a, a significant number of people who are properly educated in the top universities and so on and so forth who enter the Lok Sabha and are there and have also, you know, been develop a history of being, uh, you know, part of a representative democracy. So it's really quite different from the rather thin uh, and, and fragile connection that many people have to, um, to be members of parliaments in some European states, including the United Kingdom. Mm. which doesn't have a great deal of depth to it yeah yeah i mean i guess that's that is another aspect to 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 the conversation which is the the depth as you put it you know of how much you know of political sort of activity and preparation goes in mm. uh, in some of the global south uh, uh, sort of democracies and i guess that is another um, sort of element to focus on the the importance of politics and the importance of political campaigning, political participation, uh, political sort of conversations that you have in, in the global south. 
uh, which um, you know could arguably sort of uh, be be useful. Yeah. Look, I'm afraid that we've run out of time. Um, I just wanted to say, Indrajit, that you have made us all interested in politics again, because after all, politics at the moment is the last thing any of us want to think about. But, but we, you have done that and reanimated our, our interest. And thank you for your very, very good uh, presentation, but also for your very thoughtful ideas about sharing. It's a very powerful notion. I do hope we're going to see um, you know, lots of another book from you. Well, yes, that. that, that's, that's the plan. Nothing immediately, I can assure you, but yes, over time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would that would that would be a real treat. Um, now, I'm just going to ask the panelists because they can to please unmute themselves because we are able to do the one thing that nobody can do nowadays, which is that we're going to give you a round of applause. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and to hear your questions. Um, it's really helpful because this is these are sets of ideas I'm thinking about. Uh, and I do hope to develop them over the next uh, few years. Wonderful. And thank, thank you, you for, very Yeah, thank you very, 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 very much for, for a very enjoyable uh, evening. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you soon, I hope, at the IGP. Yeah. Thanks. Take Thanks. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.